Uh, welcome back to Melbourne Strength Cultures podcast, number one in the hearts, number one in the charts. We're back after a two-week hiatus. We do apologise, but we're back uh, firing on all cylinders again, ready for the next run. We call it phase two. But today we have Ben Cantin, Benny Lifts on Instagram, the man. So I, I would put you up there as like being one of the, uh, you know how people say like your, train, your favourite trainers, favourite trainers, like those sort of people. <laughs> like everyone, everyone... I don't know. There's just a group of people that all go yeah. to you, and you're you're the guy that's teaching all the the trainers, oh. so to speak. That ma- have I made se- any sense there? Yeah, it's like, like MF Doom, the rapper. It's like your favorite rapper's favorite rapper. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. It. Like yeah there's, exactly. there's, there's there's technicality. There's things that make uh, someone that people look to for advice. Yeah, it's a bit. But you don't, I don't know, you don't fit that into like a little a mantle or a little slogan I can put somewhere. We'll, we'll make I, you a trophy. Something. We'll, yeah. we'll sort you I out think you should put that in your IG bio. Maybe. For sure, you, we can make it fit. Your favorite trainer's favorite trainer. <laughs> sort of. It's going on a t-shirt. Easy, easy. Yeah, but welcome. Thank you for ha- thank you for coming down, mate. Thanks for inviting me, and thanks for uh, re re reigniting phase two of the podcast. One thing I wanted to chat about uh, chat about with <coughs> fuck, I'm rusty. One thing I wanted to chat about <laughs> with you was your training because I've seen videos at Hammer House. Did you used to train at Hammer House? Yes. Yes. Charlie and I used to train at Hammer House. I, I was trained there right up until the lockdowns. Um, and then when the lockdowns hit, I sort of canned my membership because we were locked down. I was training in the garage and then I just never got it back again. But the main reason I had my, my Hammer House membership is because we didn't have a league extension. And I just uh, wanted to use a league extension. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So I never day. actually met you at Hammer House, but I would see them tag you or you tag them and they'd share it or something. There was like a little way yeah. in which you popped up on their social media and then it would be you pulling like 300 for sets of like 10 or 12 or something savage. That might have been uh, 2017 comp prep, man. Ah, really? So yeah, coach Jimmy was down there. Jimmy Contonis coached with the him. Big boy. Was there once a week. And then, yeah, would have been there for about six so months. So he was your coach? Yeah, I'm going to be coaching me for that last yeah, yeah. set of shows that I did, basically. Yep. So. Nice. And he's uh, he now owns Athleticon. Is mm-hmm. that correct? Yeah. Around the corner. Yeah. Around the corner on, uh, what is that road? Cochrane's. Cochran's. Cochran's. Yeah, yeah, nice. So you, uh, you were doing bodybuilding back then? Yeah. So Slam you were pulling dance. 300 for 10 in your comp prep? No, that wasn't comp prep though. I think I think the, okay. three, the 300 for 10 was definitely not comp prep. Okay. Um, <laughs> in fact, I didn't deadlift in that comp prep actually now that I think about it. So it must have been at Volve that you saw that. That, uh, that would know. have been after comp prep. I know what you're talking about. I just about saw now. this elusive man just fucking pulling heavy deadlifts around social <laughs> yeah, media. Yeah. 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 I got this thing. I don't know. Everyone asks me what my one rep max is and I have. I say I have no idea. Yeah. If I pull it up, I ain't putting it down until... You know, I'm done until my yeah. back's fried. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. what is your what is your max rep? Oh, not max rep, but max set. Then that's what's the, what's your most uh, like your biggest set? The biggest, the 300 by 10 has to be the biggest, just because it is what it is, right? Yeah. yeah. But I think one of my funnest ones would have been like I did 220 by 21. <laughs> I think <laughs> at home in lockdown. <laughs> And everything just feels heavy at home. I don't know if you guys actually yeah. trained at home. Yeah. There's happy. different demons in the garage. De- was, <laughs> what is it? I was oh, depressed. Man, everything felt really heavy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I remember hitting that yeah, it's, one. It's your feelings, mate. That's yeah. what that yeah. is. And I remember man. just rolling around on the ground afterwards. I just had I had lactic acid in my mouth. I felt like so fucking sick. Those garage sessions, that took whatever year and a half, two years, whatever it was, has, has definitely, you know, we talk about Goggins callousing the mind. That's cha- like when I train here now, it's just so easy. Yeah. Because that was a battle, that that, that yeah. period. That was some dark sessions, yep. staring at the brick wall. So you pulled two, 220 in your garage at home during lockdowns. What about some other lifts? Squats? I'm a horrible squatter. Horrible squatter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never squatted anything over 250, 260. I can't remember. Oh, yeah, just the, yeah, 250, shit. 260 for how many reps? No, for like a single, maybe. Oh, for a single. oh maybe a triple yeah. or something, something like, like that. that. I can't remember, but it was yeah. horrible. Bench? Bench. I never really did bench. I did incline. That would have been like... 180-ish. Oh, wow. Yeah. Savage. Holy shit. Nice. Um, couldn't flat bench for shit, though. Yeah. So when you were training for your, your bodybuilding comps, you said that wasn't in one of your comps. What was your comp prep like? Because we've had Hattie Boydell on before. Booz and I spoke to Hattie when we were in Queensland. Uh, and, and she was sort of explaining how she still likes to keep the big lifts in, mm. in her comp preps and all of that sort of stuff. Um, because it gives, like, training a... a sort of like a performance goal and, a, and and all of that sort of stuff is wrapped up in, in it. Um, is that something that you did? Were you doing the big compounds or are you more of this like isolation? So like, try to explain your, your training philosophy a bit. Yeah. yeah. So in my earlier years of competing, I would keep like the deadlifts in and things like that. Uh, obviously they come with like a level of fatigue that you don't necessarily mm. need to be accruing like during a dieting phase of a comp prep. 
Uh, but I enjoy them and I just seem to not kind of like bear the burden of a lot of that fatigue, you know, as yep. long as I kind of put some thought into what was happening on the auxiliary level as well. Yep. That last prep that I did in 2017, though, I had an umbilical hernia that I found out pretty much right as I started that prep, which was at seven months. So I didn't deadlift or squat or anything that whole prep because I was actually concerned about what it was going to look like more than the health side of it yep. come the actual show. And yep. then thankfully it kind of like just healed itself visually pretty well to the point where it didn't really interfere with what it looked like on stage, but I stayed away from like any of those big lifts throughout yeah, that the prep. Yeah, big bracing. Yeah, no, none of that. Yeah, so you haven't had any issues with that since? No, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. Um, because <clears throat> you've got a hernia, don't you? I do have a hernia. you got a... Inguinal. Inguinal, yeah. yeah. I had, had one of those. Just sticks out, pop it back in. <laughs> <laughs> I had surgery on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. did you? I haven't yeah, had it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the interns, Ash, is, reckons he's got one. He was full stressed. And I was like, oh, man, I've had it for like three years. Just push it back in. And he was like, <laughs> the way I, like, I was just so relaxed about it. But I have speak, spoken to Dan downstairs about it and our other friend who's a doctor as well. And they, yeah, they said surgery is the only option to, if, if it's not cause, it doesn't cause me any pain. I can train fine. So yeah. just pop it back in. Just hammer and chisel. <laughs> The one thing I've thought to do that I haven't really done is doing a little bit more anterior core work. Um, but, yeah, it's because it's been a bit lazy. Yeah. <laughs> so we interrupt this program for a word from our sponsors, which is today, Get Going PT. I remember when I first started in the industry back in 2012, I was working in a commercial gym, recreation, health and fitness uh, in Moorabbin. And <clears throat> my PT manager at the time had... had had promised me a, a large lift of clients and that I would be at capacity within like three or six months or something like that. And it turned out that they were just selling me the dream uh, of being a PT in a big commercial gym. And unfortunately, I think this is what is quite common in the industry is that uh, young PTs, impressionable B PTs, without any business experience, get sucked into these big contracts at these big commercial gyms uh, and then just sort of get hung out to dry uh, when the new PT comes along and they eventually get sold the dream as well. The great thing with Get Going and, and why we like to sponsor or why we like to partner with Get Going uh, on the podcast here is because we, we know we have a lot of young PTs that listen um, and, and feel these same experiences that I myself went through. And it wasn't until I found a, a mentor... Uh, uh, with the first smaller facility that, that I worked with until I started to find success. So Get Going offers this uh, this this mentoring piece. They they definitely have leads. They're, they're there and waiting. We like to joke about it, but they definitely are. Um, so if you're a young PT looking for a better opportunity to start in your career, Get Going PT could be a fantastic place to start. Uh, they're linked down below, first link in the bio. Or you can go to www.getgoingpt.com.au forward slash careers if you're interested in getting started as a personal trainer with Get Going. We can't recommend them enough. Back to the show. Oh, back to the show. That's probably so, the only thing you can do. Yeah. Um, you said off air that you're in your like your baby making years. What's your training currently like? <laughs> Mate. Training. Obviously, obviously you're not in any comp preps, not not shredded, no, not or not no. not uh, like it, it's, it's just a case of, um, like, I'm downsized at the moment. I've um, reduced the training frequency as well. Yep. Uh, I, honestly, may, it's mainly now probably just full body workouts three to four days a week at the moment. Um, get this baby making stuff all, all wrapped <laughs> up and uh, kind of, like, put my head down a little bit and get back into it. But it's been nice because, like, I've just got some new business ventures on the on the go, parenting with the two little boys. So just a shift of priorities for now. Yeah. Uh, and then hopefully not get too over the hill to bring it all back in line. <laughs> Yeah, you spoke about your kids there, but I want to move on to that topic. Didier, what, Didier's the other coach who's unfortunately not here, but he's a sardine lover and a mackerel lover. And I've seen that you uh, incorporate <laughs> sardines in your, your boys' diets religiously. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty good. Like, um, I, I put stuff up like that, but you know, it's like just a snapshot. My, kid, my kids are just as horrible as any yeah, other kids sure. when it comes to like their <laughs> yeah. preferences with eating. Uh, but what is funny is just, you know, obviously I eat a lot of sardines and I just found with both of them, like giving them that option early on as whole fish. They loved it. Yeah. Like they absolutely loved it. Ruben, who's the my oldest now, he'll be three soon. Uh, he won't eat them now, but Arlo, my, my littlest one, he's still- He's off them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my wife's pretty good at making up actual proper food, you know like patties and things like that that look a little bit better than what I do, just like <laughs> slap a tin of sardines. And yeah, they just eat what I eat. Yeah. If I'm eating meat, they're eating meat. If I'm eating sardines, they're eating sardines. I put yeah. no effort in. Yell at them, food is for function. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> what's, uh, what's your favourite brand of sardines? 
Uh, we just mainly stick with the Brunswick ones, actually. Brunswick, yeah. I got the Sol, is it Sol Mar? Sol, Sol Mar? Yeah. yeah, I like those ones. And Because I slam sardines too. I'm a Mediterranean yeah. diet. I like <laughs> the sardines. Yeah. Um, I love them, man. Do you ever buy them, like, from the fish manga, like, whole? Not really. I, mean, I think I have a couple of times over the years, yeah. but, I mean, we go through them at a rate. Yeah, like I'll pretty much tray at a time when we buy them. There's no oh, point. really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We go through them like we crush them. Yeah, crazy. So, so, so that I wanted to ask you, just, just the segue that preceded this segue is more so like it sounds like you're you started at GNC doing stuff, yeah, yeah, and then building into a bodybuilding career, whatever else, working with bodybuilders. But what I look at now, the and what I've seen from the snapshot that is your IG, and as you see, you, you don't post too much on there anymore. At what point did you transition from like the calories in, calories out bodybuilder, if you were ever there, mm. to what you're doing now, which is more that nutritional focus? I wouldn't say it's like the nitty grittier sort of biochem focus. Because I think for a lot of us and a lot of people in the fitness industry, like you hear it's like the secret is calorie deficit, like yeah. fat loss. And that's all you hear. But it seems as, well, not it seems, there is so much more to nutrition and that's like level one. At what point or was there a tr transition for you that you started to, to hone in on that a bit more? i got to probably preface that and say that it probably started more back towards the like whole foods portion control when I started. Because when, when I was working in GNC, I'm sure everyone knows what a GNC is. It's a, you know, they're not here in Australia anymore, but they're very big overseas, still the, the supplement stores. And back in the day when I started in GNC in Australia, it was pretty high caliber of employees that worked there. Like most people were, like there's a lot of naturopaths and nutritions, dietitians, physiotherapists. And then you had like, you know, actual competing bodybuilders and things like that. So, the, and there was no competition really to them back then. So it was a decent caliber of people that worked there, but you would, you would service the customers a little bit more like clients when you could, you know mm. what I mean? You just had that time like to do that in that mm. retail setting. You'd get down, we would be like writing out lots of notes for them and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that worked uh, in, you know, the favor for the business, but it also meant that you would get into conversations around nutrition a lot like that, but you didn't go into like calories and things like that. Yeah. You know, yeah, you'd yeah, be yeah. just going like broad strokes talking about like, Hey, you know, fish is high in omega-3. Like, you know, if you got this amount of portions over the week, you'd be covering your bases. We probably didn't say that because then we wouldn't sell fish oil, <laughs> right? But anything else that we couldn't <laughs> sell, we probably would have been given advice out for. Always be selling. Don't worry. Yeah, we're, we're big on always be selling. It's, always yeah, be closing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm only joking. When in doubt, um, stitch them up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But so... So yeah, so prefacing it would have been like that. Yeah, and okay. then as you kind of like head into more of the, you know, the nuanced body composition goal side of things with a one-on-one -on -one client and stuff like that, you obviously have to sort of hone in, be a little bit more specific um, and then, you know, set it up towards obviously like calories or macronutrients or whatever method you're going to use. Mm. Um, and I suppose like, like everything, you just kind of like watch – in the world of social media, you're, you're watching the content and the education that's being put out there and kind of seeing if something that you have to offer like adds any value to it. You know what I mean? And there was just, I was doing a lot of consultative work with fitness people where I would just see chicken, broccoli, mm. rice, beef, green beans, sweet potato. And it was just that over and over. And then you would be like, see people like, oh, look, you know, this is going on with my blood work. You know, this is going on with my, you know, some certain symptoms that I'm having. And I'm like, plug your nutrition into like an app and sort of see what's going on. And you'd mm. see like most fitness people are coming nowhere near their intake of calcium requirements. You know, they're not having dairy because you know, it's a thing mm. or, you know, maybe they don't eat fatty fish, you know, those kind of things. And so whilst these diets, you know, you want to keep it as simple as possible for the sake of you know, preference and sustainability. But if you have these gaps, it's like, well, what are some s solutions that are like easily applicable mm. to just fill those gaps? And that's kind of where I tried to kind of like start that conversation. Yeah, yeah. Just bridge the gap from just like this this thing where it's so micronutrient deficient to yeah. just basics, probably have some calcium, like just uh, little things like 100%, that. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like just, you know, without trying to keep it like, you know, in that 15-second attention span type thing uh, that is social media sometimes, it's like, you know, I would be talking about it like, hey, look, yes, you might love rice, but – if you don't get a lot of fruit and vegetables in and you need to be looking after your potassium intake, consider getting some tubers in there that are just a much richer source of potassium. Mm, mm. If you do love fruit and vegetables and they're 
you know, a plenty in your plan, then it de-emphasizes the need for you to be even considering potatoes from that perspective, but maybe you're considering them from a satiety perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just little things like that. So people can go, oh, okay, well, that's an easy change for me. Look, it's actually bumped up that nutrient and I'm sort of covering myself across the board where I want it to be. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy yeah. how, um, like, it's a, it's a common conversation, but this whole, uh, this whole like, performance or uh, performance health spectrum type of thing, and we're even... People who you would think, like you look at bodybuilders and obviously not just the physical, but their their approach in general quite often can be seen as like a healthy approach. Like it's it's um, whole foods, all of that sort of stuff. But even them, maybe even not in the extremes of like a, a prep and, and the depths of it, but even just like in the, the general training phase, they're still seeing like deficiencies within their diet. What other deficiencies... So you, you spoke about calcium there. What are the other common ones that people are sort of generally missing... Um, that you come across specific to fitness oh just or? in general like the, the, the people you deal with because calcium is obviously a big one like omega-3 I, I i probably am deficient in that i don't need a lot of yeah. i get a salmon fillet well. every now and then but yeah, yeah i wouldn't see it <laughs> yeah yeah what are the ones sardines, that you come across boys. yeah sardines <laughs> what are the ones sardines. that you come across in general uh look i mean when i yeah when i look, run across the gamut of different diets that i would see Big ones would be like omega-3 for anyone who's not eating fatty fish, uh, vitamin E, choline, uh, potassium often, uh, calcium definitely, really definitely. Uh, vitamin D a lot because we still give that like a nutritional target when, you know, I, I think that obviously that really depends upon your exposure to sunlight, yeah. you know, UV to how yeah. you're really going to keep your vitamin D supplies adequate. So I don't really consider that, um, really significant from a dietary perspective. But there's some of the basic nutrients which you would see a lot under. Um, sometimes even B12, like there's just a lot of people into health and fitness that won't be consuming uh, protein sources that are rich in B12. And you'll notice they're just not even hitting those targets. Um, I think a lot of people's idea of a decent vegetable intake is a lot lower than what the reality of that should be. And that leads to, you know, potentially lower potassium and folate, which is a big deal. So... That's a couple. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what 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 are the sort of vegetable recommendations that you would have? We we track vegetables in like hundred gram in installments. Uh, so like you're trying to eat like five hundred grams or something, three hundred grams in a meal or something like that. What what sort of recommendations for an array of vegetable intake would you? I'm um, not too much different. Yeah, pretty similar. Like it's pretty simple. Like I, I yeah. think if you, I like to keep things simple. So when I'm sort of like working with a client and you're asking them about uh, what is their meal prepping look like for their uh, sustainability. And I'm like, do, do you want options, say, with vegetables, which are like frozen veggie packs that are freely available? And most people like that, even if they're going to do, use fresh. Why? Because just in case there's a, a plan B that needs to come into play, you can opt for that, that frozen veggie intake. So whether it's like broccoli and cauliflower, you know, peas, corn and carrots or whatever combos, and then kind of like working off a minimum amount per day. Yeah. Um, I do something very similar. Yeah. You know, so... Yeah, and that might be anywhere from you know five hundred to eight hundred grams of veggies or something like that. Yeah, just a a, a, r a rough gauge. There's nothing worse than when someone starts trying to uh, count macros in their way and their zucchinis in their way and their bloody broccolis. Yeah. And you're like, mate, just let's pull back here. Yeah. <laughs> Get the whole lot. I want to ask in terms of because this is something that I find as an issue with myself is trying to gain weight. I very often find that when I'm cutting lower calories, my food intake, the quality of it is a lot better. I do prioritize a lot more fruit and vegetable just to feel satiated, feel full. And then as soon as I go back to bulking, my appetite drops and you start to go for those more energy dense options and probably the, the fruit and veg intake and the quality of food drops down. Would you always want to prioritize food quality first before pushing someone into a high calorie, like into a surplus, like four, four and a half thousand cows, 5,000 plus? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, like I would treat it as a hit your minimums first and yep. then everything after that is kind of like up for up for negotiation, you know, like be as flexible as you need. So I think it, you, there's kind of like this this threshold that a lot of people have, you know, for myself, it's kind of like three and a half thousand calories. I get mm. to about that point and every 500 to a thousand calories after that, it's like, oh, it's a bit of a task, you know, yeah. to be trying to think about this from a whole foods perspective. That's where I'm looking at like more cereals or just like the meals that I choose are just a little bit more palatable to increase the serving size, you know, than I would traditionally have and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I think that's just the conversation you have with everyone who is on that 4,000, 4,500 calorie mark. Mm -hmm. It's like, let's 
try not to sacrifice those over the longer run um, and come up with a solution that you know, we can build from that and make it as easy as possible. Yeah. Bare minimums. A smoothie. Bare minimums. Something I wanted to smoothie. ask you, uh, it's it like it seems like it's getting more and more common now. Like previously, and this is, we've seen it just come out of like geared circles almost. Like Broderick Chavez is the one that, that, that I've, follow just out of interest more than anything and it was just talking about bloods like interest, you're gonna, interest <laughs> yeah interest yeah um so it's just bloods like just bloods as a whole and it just seems like it's always been a if you're doing gear you gotta you gotta do your bloods and, and look at that to make sure that things aren't out of whack or whatever but it seems and this is out of his mouth as well that it's been more popularized even for natural athletes mm. why do you think that is oh it would well my assumption is it is because of the awareness that's out there with you know people seeing these educators on social uh, social media. You know what I mean. So now it's like, oh well, I want to look dig deeper into my my own health and stuff like that. And it probably it probably has a like people with a tendency for health probably have a proclivity towards wanting to be a little bit more nuanced to go well what are my actions leading to as far as the outcomes are mm. of my internal health. You know, can I quantify that? Is there something I can work on? Um, you know, and that might guide people with better decisions, hopefully not more you know, obsessive uh, kind of actions based on that. You do see that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. get really caught up on numbers uh, within blood work, just as they might get caught up on numbers around body composition, like mm. a scale weight or something like that. But I think it's just, you know, as you point out, it's out there now. Everyone's seeing it. There's an awareness of it. Um, we talked about this earlier before we jumped in the room. You know, you're at a point now where you can literally... You know, we live in an age where you can touch base with anyone around the world who's an expert in things like this, book mm. an appointment or a consultation and get it looked at. Like that's, that didn't happen 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, so if someone's got their bases covered, say they're, they're able to do the bare minimums, where would that next step in both performance and health look like for you? So it's like they're nailing their bare minimums of veggies, like it looks like they're having their basic serves of their fatty fish per week. Is there another level in supplementation? Would that be somewhere you would push someone to go do their blood work so they can start to cater a bit more of an approach or is that two in the weeds? Um, I, I think like for me, it, it's about not overcomplicating something if it's working well and there's mm. no red flags for, you know, it to be a complicated investigation. Yeah. You know, so it, like, like sometimes I get asked, like, do you do blood work with every person you work with? And I'm like, no. Mm. Like some of the people I work with are like super simple cases. It's, it's like the easiest coaching experience in the world. Mm. You know mm. what I mean? Um, and they just seem to be like everything we track and measure is like, you know, in the green uh, and we're good. So if all of those things are covered, what I'm really looking for is like, is there a context for going deeper? Mm. And then it's like, well, what is that for instance? Like maybe it's a prep. Like maybe it's like someone wants to enter into like a real hard caloric deficit, you know, or something like that. Mm. Uh, maybe it's a push phase or a peaking for like a meat or something. So th these are all things where it's like, well, it's looking at the allostatic load and, or, you know, what the future looks like over, you know, that, that given time frame, mm. and seeing is there a purpose for um, doing a certain thing. Yeah. You yeah. know, so it like often my competitors, like in bodybuilding, for instance, would discuss this. And then, you know, one of the reasons I know they've chosen me as a coach is it's like, hey, I want there to be a more nuanced feedback in terms of the nutrition. Like I want to I want to prep with like all the micronutrients and stuff. <laughs> and then they get into prep and they realize, fuck the micronutrients, yeah. man. I just want to I just want to live, yeah. you know. <laughs> and so they'll be going, oh, hey, coach, can I swap out this for that? You know, and it's just ridiculous. I'm like, of course you can. <laughs> Uh -huh. Of course you can swap it out. Just hit the hit the macros, hit the calories. Like it doesn't matter. And then yeah, they'll yeah. get a little bit concerned about that. I'd be like, you're getting up in stage in six weeks to get judged with a lot of tan on and a bikini. Like, <laughs> don't worry about like, if you're not hitting your B12 this week, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's not the thing to be worrying about. Like we, we are going to, <clears throat> not that, not that you want to encourage people not to hit their targets, but I'm just saying it's, it's not the priority right now. And it's yeah. like, as we're going through those push phases, it's like, Hey, this is the time when we relieve those, those uh, that structure, so that we can really hone in on just making this get from point A to point B, and then after point B, like the show's done, the meat's done, or whatever, we assess, we reflect, and then we sort of like build out the strategy moving forward. Okay, yeah. It, so it's I, I would never have thought that, and and it's just human psyche, but um, 
that you get fixated on those numbers and stuff. Like you get your blood, like there'd be people out, but 100% there would be. There'd be people out there that are using blood tests and using the numbers and the metrics in the blood test as just more data to hyper fixate on and analyze and, and yeah. all of that sort of stuff. This is why I barely do a single genetic test anymore. Yeah? Yeah, there was a time like in 20... I want to say like 2015 to 2017 maybe where, you know, everyone wanted their 23andMe genetic testing done. Yeah. You know, let's look at these polymorphisms and these genetic differences that we have. And I love that stuff. I'm like, sweet. <laughs> like this is right up the biochem alley. <laughs> and then trying to discuss and convey that with a client and without them taking some kind of like fatalistic perspective of <laughs> like what's going to happen in the future. I'm like, this is just not having the outcome that I desire. There is yeah. like a fixation here that's kind of like becoming really hard to manage even with personality types that I, I wouldn't think would have kind of slipped into suffering from that kind of issue. Yeah. And I was like, I'm nearly done with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because we, we work with what we've got and you have no problems. Yeah. What, what sort of data would you be taking out of that? Or like, what are the benefits of, I would I know nothing been, of genetic. Yeah. Tests. I know nothing. I know yeah. yeah, yeah. It, like yeah. this is a, a few, uh, a proper novice sort of question, but like <laughs> yeah. what going into that, what was the hope to get information from? Like, yeah. Like a lot of the time what they want to know is like, um, like am I at a higher risk for certain things? So there's yeah. like certain uh, polymorphisms, which is like, you know, ch changes to our DNA yeah. that might predispose us to more cardiovascular problems down the line. It might interfere with our metabolism of certain vitamins, you know, the way that we synthesize things or, you know, transport them. And, and that could mean that like at the cellular level, things aren't working as optimally. So you might end up with a like suboptimal health scenario based on that. Um, but the point is, it's like, it, it is nice to know those things because we'd be like, okay, you have like a 65% down regulation in this particular enzyme, which means that, you know, the product of that particular reaction could be a little bit lower than what we'd want. But then there's there's things that we can do. Like the body's very smart. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's just like, we, we work on the behavioral side of things. We work on the nutrition. And, you know, for the most part, like a lot of these things can be completely non-worrisome. Yeah, it's the same with... um. And, and this is like, you can get in the new, I feel like it's the same conversation, but you can get in the nuance of training and all these optimizations and all these sort of things. But quite often the practical application is always the same. Yeah, It's like hard training's hard training. We've got to track your volume in some capacity. And like, if we hit these markers, it doesn't almost matter yeah. what we're sort of seeing and presenting with because it, it all just falls back into this same sort of framework. So I'm assuming it would be very similar. Yeah. And yeah. I think most of us as coaches, you know, uh, whether you're dealing mainly with you know training or whether it's nutrition or whether it's like behavior and other aspects of health you know throughout the 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 mastery phase of like gaining this expertise you, you go into the weeds for a bit right only to come out you know you go wow i've got a lot more questions okay i've got to take what's useful discard the rest or just put it aside you know um and, and it, you you come back to if you made things overly complex you come back to going Simple worked. What was I doing? Yeah. You know? mm. But you usually come out of it just with like a, a better version of your, your systems. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I can definitely feel that without a doubt. I want to come back to the blood work um, and in the prep. And you said like coming out of the prep, obviously there would be a different strategy and all of those sort of things. Um, how would that process look from a just a blood's perspective? So are you taking bloods like... 12 weeks out or at the very start of the prep and then like a midway point and then after to see what sort of quote unquote not damage is probably the wrong term but see mm. what has actually changed or are you are you looking at just like general averages from like science or whatever like how how is that process actually built out yeah that look it may depend like rather than it being uh like a protocol or like a structured thing for every every client for instance yeah um it, it would depend on that on that individual. But for the most part, like broad strokes, a lot of clients that I work with might get their blood work done every six months. The ones that want to get it done or need to get it done a little bit more regularly might be every three months or so. How that fits along, you know, like a given 12-month snapshot as it, you know, uh, with you know, prep periods and things like that, what you'd often find is like you're going to get some kind of uh, set of data, usually when you start with the client, you know, and then probably one like halfway through like a prep period. And then usually I would wait for a couple of weeks to a, you know, a month or so after the prep period to go and get the next set of bloods. Yeah. Um, because especially with these bodybuilders are getting to like, you know, extremely low percentages of body fat and, and things like that. Like it, you're, it's 
the snapshot that you're looking at, unless you just kind of see what it what it what, what it's to, done. Yeah, yeah during that phase it's like oh hey it's probably not going to be the best we knew that <laughs> like it's interesting to see but like again it's like are we going to have this person come out of that going all fatalistic on yeah, it, you know? Yeah. It's like, that wasn't the goal. I'm like, I can tell you they're going to be rubbish right now. Look at you. <laughs> you're, a, you're a skull. Uh, <laughs> but but what we want to see is like, you know, on the recovery period from that, like yeah. how have things, you know, gotten, you know, looking at the thyroid hormones, looking at the sex hormones, looking at just the general hematology and things like that. Yeah, so Just jumping in to let you know, we are available for online coaching. If you're looking to get more out of your training, we'd love to get you on board. DM any of the coaches on Instagram or head to the first link in our bio. Cheers. Because uh, um, we've we've spoken to uh, Beth. I think that was you and me. Beth Clare Fitness up in uh, Sydney. Or where were we? We're Sydney. Sydney, Sydney. Just outside of Sydney. Um, and she was saying, because she had done uh, natural competitions, but her hormones were... I think it took her like two two years to get her period back or something mm. like that. Uh, and you hear about these really long roads to sort of get back to quote-unquote healthy. Um whether you're male or female and what that is to you. But um, what is it like, what actually happens in that? What does get so downregulated and what, what actually is causing these like long-term health implications coming off like extended periods of deficits and, yeah. and really reduced body fats? Yeah. It's pretty, uh, again, this is like, it's an individual thing for yeah. each client, but I te- just tend to make sure that we have that conversation when you begin working, especially with like a female client that wants to consider getting very low body fat, for instance, you, you just say, Hey, this isn't the healthiest thing in the world. Like, have you been to competitions before? And the amount of women that I get inquiries with who, who haven't like, even been to a competition, like, I think you should go to one first rather than just kind of and like, just, observe. just yeah. go and observe and have a look and sort of see what the day's about. Because otherwise you could, build it up in your head based on what you see on social media to be something that's completely different to what it actually is all day. So go get some exposure to that to start with. Um, And then, oh, sorry, I just forgot your question. Um, It was more like, like what is, what actually happens? Oh yeah. yeah, Sorry. Like the physiological sort of changes. Like, yeah. And so, you know, throughout that process, you're going to get like a a down regulation to like a lot of these hormones, you know, thyroid hormone is going to go down like these sex, sex hormones for, this is both men and women, you know, are going to go down. They're going to tank hard as you get into low body fat levels, your stress hormones, your glucocorticoids are going to be getting higher and stuff like that. And the recovery period does look different for everyone. So, you know, you want to be approaching a prep in a way that puts the least amount of stress on the body, given what we're doing anyway is very stressful, uh, so that you hopefully minimize, you know, the uh, that occurring. Um, but there's no guarantees. Mm. You yeah. know what I mean? As someone mentioned Broderick before. What would he say? It's the price of doing business. Mm. It was you, it wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's the price of doing business. Yeah. Price of doing business. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, <laughs> but look, you know, for the most part, I, I'm very fortunate that I don't see a lot of that. I don't, I, I tend to coach probably more women doing the categories where they're not having to get quite as lean. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of the shows, uh, the categories within the shows now do offer, uh, like there's a wellness category now, which is kind of like a mix uh, in between bikini and fitness, for instance, which is kind of nice because like a lot of girls who have a, a larger percentage of lower body fat, um, sorry, of body fat on their lower body, have to go pretty hard to get that lean enough to do well in these fitness categories. And going from lean up top with a you know decent amount of body fat still below to ripped down there as well, that is like a whole other level of like effort. You're required. at the end of it. But yeah. you're, at a, you're at a much more burden on the body to get to that. So it's, um, it's interesting, like for a bit of an old timer like me in the game now in these federations and seeing these categories come out, initially you're kind of like, that ain't bodybuilding. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that, and then you realize it's probably better. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's, uh, it's probably better for some of these, you know, because because it's not subculture anymore. Like everyone's doing some kind of competition mm. and stuff like that. So they're not they're not just kind of hardcore people. They're just a lot of average people who love fitness and want to kind of incorporate that into it. Probably for a short period of their yeah, life. I think so. I think when we definitely started training, it was quite common that people who were coming into fitness like would just fall in the bodybuilding route and actually start doing competitions. Like, cause powerlifting wasn't really around or natural power, uh, uh, not natural, sorry, uh, raw powerlifting wasn't really around too much. So that stream wasn't really open. So a lot of people just sort of came into fitness and then just fell into bodybuilding. Yeah. Um, are you still seeing that at the same sort of, or is it sort of changed and shifted a little bit? I feel like the, since, since COVID, like I feel like there's just been a shift down for sure. Yeah. You know, the last three years, but, but up until that point, yes. 
Yeah. So I should say, I don't know, like over the last three years, people have just reflected a little bit more upon <laughs> what's feasible or what makes them happy or, <laughs> you know, like what it takes to do certain things, but I'm not seeing as, as many recently. Uh, but given that, like, I mean, we've only been out of like lockdowns for however long it's been months, as yeah. well. Like, it's I think a lot crazy. of people are coming from way too far back in their fitness yeah. to probably be putting that up as like a, Hey, I want to go out and do this straight away. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, but I agree with you. Like I was getting that for so long and then I, I really just tried to have the discussion of like, I don't know if this is appropriate for your goal, given you don't display any of these characteristics at like a, you know, at like a fundamental level, like you don't really enjoy the process that much. <laughs> uh, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, and it's like, you get your, t- you know, some of these girls, for instance, are up there for all of five minutes. They don't get a call out. They get up there, they spin, they, you know, and then it's done. And that is their, that's their glamour. 24 <laughs> weeks of effort wrapped up in 10 minutes. It's, um, it's funny. Not right? everyone comes away with like having the, you know, the wreath or the trophy yeah. or the medal <laughs> and that kind of thing. Um, so the only experience I have of a bodybuilding comp was the uh, Melbourne at the, at the convention center. The Arnold's yeah. or something. Yeah. With, it the was fin- in the Arnold? Fitness Expo. Fitness Expo. Mm-hmm. Was, the powerlifting was, was next to it. I was competing next to it. And yeah, yeah so, you had powerlifting and then the bodybuilding right next door. And you... They were both sections were like quote unquote caged off. They're not caged off, but they're just like dividers of like steel fences yeah. that have just been erected to keep the powerlifters here and the bodybuilders there and to minimize the traffic of just randoms walking through the area. But you'd look in there and obviously everyone's fake tan, like everyone's lean, but on the stage you see like this smiling because it's part of the show. Like you, see, but then as soon as they would walk yeah. off, they literally just turned into like ghosts. Yeah. They'd sit down, <laughs> their faces, like, you could just, they just become drained. And yeah, you're like, yeah, holy yeah. shit, like, this is actually, like, it's almost scary, like, sitting at the back with, and there was people, someone passed out, there was, like, medics there and stuff. I was like, holy shit. Yeah. Like, that's, that's what I was going to ask you when you said, like, are you really sure you want to do this? If so, maybe go to a show first. And I'm thinking about what's the deterrent, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, if you go there and you really want to do it, okay, but what is the deterrent? What do you think someone will go there and be like, you know what, I thought I wanted to do this, but after seeing, I really don't want to do this. Like, what, what, what is that? Like, to you, what do you think would deter someone after going? I think, like, just getting them involved with, like, the type of people that are at the shows, for instance, and talking to the competitors, hearing the story, <laughs> seeing what it takes. Sometimes, kind of, like, it's a bit of a reality check of, like, where they are right now, like, with their own physique, just mm. to kind of go, you talk about doing a show, but you're going to realise what what's, that looks like up there and where you are now, mm. it's not a 12-week transformation challenge. Mm. Yeah, it ain't, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? It's a lot more than that from where you are right now. Uh, and so a lot of people think they're going to inquire with a like a, a bodybuilding coach or something like that. The prep's going to start the next day and they're going to be able to do a show at the end of the year. Yeah, And they're just not in a position to be able to do that. Mm. You know, so it's just, yeah, it's just, I, I think it's just part and parcel of just trying to make sure that people make the right choices. And if you look at social media and look a lot of... At, a lot of the women that have competed and have retired, you'll hear like a lot of the stories come out about like, I wouldn't necessarily say regret, but like there's definitely like a hard conversation about like this was important to me at this stage in my life and I made some decisions that if I was to go back, I wouldn't do that and that's why I'm on social media talking about like yeah, know, yeah. Um, this openly, you know, if you're thinking about taking this up, just, you know, consider it, mm. you know, get the right advice don't make a like a quick decision because it's not necessarily, as we pointed out, the healthiest thing in the world. Um, you know, there was a year, I want to say 20, where are we, 22? So 2020, uh, two years ago, where I think I had 11 cases of amenorrhea with clients, you know? So not all of it was bodybuilding, sorry. Mm-hmm. A lot of it was just dieting, chronic dieting, you know? And so loss of period and, and that kind of thing. Mm. And so it's, there's a lot of it out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, There's, so I toyed with the idea. I toyed with it like quite heavily. Like I've always had an interest in it, like muscular development. Like my old man, like in the eighties, thirties, he just loved. It. Like it was that was that was him. And I'm like, you know, I always toyed with it. I've just come off an ankle, a pretty hectic ankle injury. I was at home for two months, and I think the loss of my health in that respect is just like to think of a chronic dieting phase and to lose my health again, even for a period or whatever. I know it's not just that period. And the period after, I was like, I don't really want to do this. Like I thought I wanted to do it. And I was like, said, I'm like, I'm going to do this thing. And it just was just such like a, I don't know. It was like a moment of clarity whilst at home for such a long time. I'm like, 
I couldn't think of anything worse now. I mean, yeah, like, is that you really got to fucking want to do it. Yeah, you, you do. Really like, and wanna, wanna and like, you know, we, we've talked about it in a, in a <clears throat> uh, from this angle, right? But like, yes. I, I, you know, I enjoyed my bodybuilding experiences. Yeah, and like, yeah, when, yeah. when people sort of say like, what do I remember about it and things like that? It's not really a lot of the stage stuff, you know? Um, the, I was very fortunate like to, to win a lot of shows and to travel as well. And uh, don't get me wrong, like it was nice on the days, but the, the, parts of it that I really relish was just like the photos when no one else is in the gym and you look in there and you just you do you look like a skeleton you know you just like you look so ugly and so old right <laughs> but you know that you've got lines everywhere yeah, and that yeah. like it took so much like every decision of like that day and the weeks and months preceding that it. yeah yeah you had to go get uh so that that builds character it builds a lot of things yes you know and um but there are other ways to do that as well. <laughs> there are. We had this, well, Buzz yeah. and I had so this I romanticised it because of podcasts I heard of bodybuilders talking like that. I'm like, that sounds Buzz, fun. Yeah, <laughs> man. Yeah, or maybe I'm yeah. just back in. I'm just uh, swaying with the wind. Buzz, <laughs> nah, yeah. we had what a, ankle. We had a conversation. What? Buzz and I had a conversation about this because when he, he'd committed to doing the bodybuilding show, I can't remember, we were eating lunch somewhere or something, and I was like, just, like I was like, and his thing was like, if you committed though, would you do it? Like the fact that you've made it, and I was like, nah. I was like, I just know that even with the commitment, I just cave because there's not enough drive in me to even want to do that. Um, and I just, yeah, like, I don't know. It's just, I think that was a blessing in disguise for you, the ankle injury. Oh, yeah, I would have kept going. It's, it's yeah. I would have, I would have, I would have hundred percent. You had made happen. the commitment and I know you were like dead set on like finishing. Like, I wanna, I've made this commitment, I'm going to do it now. But then the ankles come. And it's reevaluated you what you want out of Yeah, what if you this want didn't training. happen, I would have been going straight on. Body. <laughs> straight to show next yeah, year. Yeah, I wouldn't want to disappoint my coach. And to, to your point before, so I remember at one of the Arnold's and um, do you guys know Lauren Green, like powerlifter from Warrior Performance in Sydney? Shannon Green, Lauren Green? Shannon Green rings a bell. Yeah, so uh, I was coaching her and it was my uh, first time backstage in the powerlifting cage. Mm. <laughs> and completely the opposite of your experience in the bodybuilding cage right i'm just like there's like just like food fights going on and yeah, just yeah. like donuts is, yeah yeah like this like everyone's happy you know um, um, yeah well, maybe me observing it, right, from, as an outsider but no, most just, most people most of them are happy there's but always there's always a couple people that are a bit d down with their performance and they crack a tantrum yeah, there's always a couple uh, but 90 percent of people yeah. are yeah. having a good time it is a completely yeah. different experience it, it was though. a it was a really different experience slam and lollies slam and monsters yeah yeah, eating bananas. Yeah, it was like, pretty crazy. Yeah. So I felt it was more of a party. <laughs> um, and then there's always someone that at the end of those comps brings out a bottle of like tequila or something. And there's there's shots being had. Yeah, happens. It's good. It's good fun. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. Uh, the art. The art. I I would highly recommend if you haven't seen a bodybuilding show. I really like that advice. Just go to one. Go to one. Suss it out. Have a look. Because it it was eye opening for me. I was like, holy moly. And then just like this is so superficial, but like there was just tan <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Oh, the like, toilet seats. I went, to say, I went to go to the toilet and there's just orange tan just all over, tan. The, over the seat. And I'm like, for fuck's sake. Yeah. It's a different world. How did, you, um, how did you initially get into bodybuilding? So obviously you were working at GNC. You are obviously training pre that. No one just... Or did you just start working at GNC? So I quit uh, my lab job. So I was working at a dental lab Uh like a laboratory, not an actual dentist. We, yep. we made stuff for the dentist basically. And I quit that. And uh, the main reason I quit it was because it was just too far to travel and it was summer. And I was just like, man, I'm so sick of this like hour drive to wherever I was going. So I had just started training with a mate and then I walked into a GNC shop and I was like, oh, look, I recognize a lot of the ingredients in supplements. I had no exposure to supplements prior to that, uh, but obviously a lot of exposure to chemicals things yeah. like that uh, in in the lab and and just like in research and stuff so that got me really keen and interested and i just sort of like started doing my own research from a nutritional biochemistry angle which i learned nothing of in school so a lot of people would say oh you did a biochem degree you must you might you must learn heaps about nutrition i'm like i learned nothing about nutrition yeah wow well. like nothing like if you open our textbooks i don't know what textbooks look like in biochemistry these days but you just did not see vitamins and stuff like that in a lot of the textbooks that we had so but it kind of got me engaged. Uh, you know, I sort of like took to training pretty quickly. I was very, very little, like I would have been like 66 kilos at 25 years of age. Wow. So, um, but I was strong. So you started training at 25? I didn't start training weights until I was 25. I wow. grew up doing like hockey, did some track at school, did a ton of swimming and skiing and stuff like that. Yep. But I was just no exposure to, to weightlifting. Yeah, so what was that first couple of years like then? Well, that's when I started with the GNC. Yep. So I went in there as a customer, 
got a role, worked my way up to GNC to like state sales manager really. So looked after quite a few stores and, and met like everyone in the industry. Um, got out of that. And then it was actually my little sister who was doing a comp under the guidance of Aaron Curtis, who's a bodybuilding coach yep. here in Australia. And she was like four weeks out from her show. And I, by that stage I was already consulting. Actually, I was doing a little bit of bodybuilding coaching as well. And she was just kind of concerned where she was at. And I said, you look great to me, but trust in Aaron. Like he's a good coach. And uh, she got me revved up though. It's kind of like what happened with you guys or something like that. Or, and um, I said, I said, you know what? I'm going to do a show. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I rang my mate and he's like, he's like, okay. Uh, you know, he's my mate who I, I, I trust. And uh, we had three weeks until the IFBB <laughs> or four weeks until the NABBA show. Yeah. And he said, do the number show, you're fat. So <laughs> You need an extra I week. I needed an extra week. And as everyone four knows, weeks. four weeks is absolutely zero time to do a show. But I was in pretty good nick. Yep. I was in pretty good nick. But I wasn't I wasn't in four weeks out nick. So I had to really, really do some uh, crazy stuff to get down. It was my first show. But I won the amateurs in, in my Oh, home. wow. Yeah. And then I went to the Aussies the week after that. And I won, uh, sorry, the, the novices. I won the novice Australias the week after that. And then the world. So you must have been in pretty good nick. Well, <laughs> I was in decent nick. I'm winning all these for, for the novice categories. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't the open class. And then I went to the worlds, which was actually in Gold Coast, uh, two weeks after that, and I came third. And so that was like you know in the span of like four weeks out from a show, three shows in four weeks. You know, not bad. Yeah. Like I, you know, I, I was just like, oh, I'm born to do this. <laughs> yeah. This is so easy. It wasn't easy at all. I had the to do fuck some, are they all complaining about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to do some pretty crazy stuff to get under 80 kilos actually for the worlds. Uh, so because I was a lot heavier than that at the Aussies. So that was there's a what a what is, are you willing to share with us us some I of just those did, strategies? I had to stop eating for a very long time. <laughs> so how many how how long are we talking? Well, probably 10 days. Oh wow, 10 days. So nothing. Yeah, no, eating, eating. nothing solid. I had a few protein shots. Oh, a few protein oh, shots. Yeah, so Spike fuck, not, nothing. Yes. I not not my particular favorite strategy to do with any clients or anything like <laughs> that for anyone who's listening. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I was weighing in at probably 86, 87 kilos at the Aussies, and I had to be under eighty kilos. Why did you have to be under eighty? Uh, the, well, I found out later that I didn't have to be under eighty. And I could have, <laughs> I could have entered into the under eighty fives if I had chose to. Yeah. Uh, but I was guided by um, the head of the federation in a phone call that he wanted me in the under 80s if I was going to represent Australia. And I thought his word was gospel. Mm. Yeah. But I yeah. found out later I could have just done my own thing. Yeah. So, But look, I would have got absolutely chopped up in the under 85s. So the under 80s suited me and I got third. So. Yeah. I just the 10 day fast so a few protein shakes how did you feel probably shit is the answer but like can you, have you got any stories of like any moments where you're like I'm um, like breaking point here or did you find it pretty crazy? Yeah. yeah I actually did break down I yeah. broke down because I was still coaching 6am classes uh, at RBT oh. back then and I was doing my cardio at about 4am in the morning and I remember I was this was in Port Melbourne and I remember like walking back from the beach it was like dead dark no one around at that time and I just remember thinking, like, what am I doing with my life? You know, just like, I was just like, Up basically like tears coming down my face, right? Because I'd just gone through, it, like, losing businesses. You know, I was in a lot of debt back then as well. Really, actually, the bodybuilding was a sort of like rise of the phoenix moment for me to kind of get my confidence back. Because I'd had, to, like, a lot of devastating shit happen prior to that. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, like the bodybuilding, just kind of putting myself through it, just showing that like I could get knocked down, but get back up, you know, yeah, that classic. Kind of thing. Yeah. It meant a lot. But to your point, you throw in 10 days of not eating in that, <laughs> yeah. that fucking broke me, right? Because I ended up in tears. I probably the like, Phoenix I finally down. broke down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was just starting to fly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just <laughs> half in ashes again. So it just gets, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny though, I think what this, this conversation makes me realize is that we all, we get to this point where I'd say, we think we are fairly, edu you're definitely fairly educated in health and fitness. And as we said, trainer's favorite trainer. Um, <laughs> but we all go through doing dumb shit at the start. Everyone we, goes we all do the dumb shit yeah. at the start. Like I don't it's know, like, I'm it's about like, to do some dumb shit. Based what? off that, I've got a holiday at Port Douglas. <laughs> well, four start weeks and I'm fucking, it's, it's, Port Douglas it sounds like a good strategy. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's all, everyone does dumb shit at the start. Yeah. It's just, are you, you know, are we smart enough to get out of that dumb shit and start doing some, I, some decent shit? I can't believe you started training at 25. Yeah. That, this goes to the point about ways to treat those 15 year olds that come into the store with a bit of egos. Just yeah. With a bit of Did you hear that story before? No. No, about the 15 year olds? It started with me touching Donnie. Yeah, I touched what? I touched Donnie's arm because I knew he had a mean training, and all I did was squeeze it, and he was like, 
I'm skinny. I've lost everything. Uh-huh. And then Ben started telling the story about how he used to, you, I'll let you tell it. No, I just, I used to, you know, GNC, you know, like I only started training at 25. Like I, my ego kind of got bigger, quicker than my body got bigger. Right. Yeah. You know, back then I was just like, Oh, this is, this is awesome. And these kids would come in and what used to piss me off is like, they're like 15, 16. And I'm like, man, they kind of look nearly not, not as good as me, but nearly as good as me. Yeah. Right. 10 years younger. And so I just used to put them back in their place a little bit. Yeah. And they'd come in and they'd be talking about like, oh, bro, you know, this and that, this and that. And I'd be like, oh, awesome, man. When are you going to start training? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and they'd be like, I've been training for two years. And they'd be like, I'm like, <laughs> but inside, I'm just like, man, I wish I'd started training, you know, when I was 15 like you. Because these I've- kids were just like you know, you're going to be so much better than me by the time I'm 25. Yeah. Man, every, everyone that we come across who he, who's in a, a, a very good position within the industry is like, yeah, I started at 12, 13, 14. <laughs> you're definitely the latest. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. So you had no, any gym experience at all, like hot, going in with school or any sporting teams? Do or you remember like the total gym 5,000? Uh, is that, a, a, was it a door? You got a door, you got a gym. Was it, was it you put it on the door? No, or it wasn't was it a door, but you're along the same line. Yeah, it was like an info. It's the, it's, it's it was an, an info. Yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad bought it. So I had oh, that nice. when I was a kid. It was one of those things that's a, like a sliding ramp thing and got the two cables. Yeah. You, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, uh, yeah. What was the ab? The ab? It, was like, it was like an ab Ab crunch. King Pro. Ab King King Pro. Pro. We had an ab King Pro. Yeah. We had a... So, we had I, the one where you sort of you had the your one feet are slides yeah, side side side. Side. <laughs> your feet are on like a little adduct isn't it adduction, fucked abduction. now those things <laughs> if it, to do one like little movement and you pay like 300 bucks for it yeah. Yeah. it's crazy so you had a total gym 5000 that's what I grew up with yeah just a little body weight stuff. that was it yeah that was it yeah, wow. I, was a, I was a whippet wow whippet. Um, with, with, so you said you were at GNC just to, again back to those initial first years of training <clears throat> um what sort of programming were you on? What what were you? Did you have a coach? No, man. No, this no, is like two thousand and five. Yeah, we're talking about we're, you know as yeah. we're, we're talking about this outside as well. Uh, yeah. But this was like the days of like once a month going to the news agents picking up muscular development, Iron yeah. Man, Muscle Mag. What else? Uh, is there anything else? There's muscle and fitness. It muscle and fitness. Blog, and then, well. Blogs would have just. Started. And then finding Jay Cutler's workout. Yeah, yeah. Doing that workout. Yeah. Having the the cell tech for the fourteen pounds in seven days, yeah, yeah, yeah. three hundred percent muscle gain yeah. in one month, yeah, yeah. That, that test that booster, day. I can't remember what the the thing was. There's some names. Shit. There were some names of subs. It was like Testoroid. <laughs> <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's some <laughs> sick names for supplements. Uh, but uh, like they just get a steroid compound, and just quite just like, like anadrol. They just twist it like anaroid, and it's like this is legal supplement. It's like all right, whatever. I'll, I'll it, trust you. Is it <laughs> anaroid? <laughs> Well, the supplement back then, the regulations on supp- supplements were a lot low, lower, weren't they? I don't know if well, like they're still fucking pretty low. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I went to go buy pre workout and it felt like I was, <laughs> it was like getting, I don't know, consulted by the drug dealer. That would have been unbelievable. Peak <sighs> Jack 3D time. Yeah. That. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Look, at GNC, because it was a global kind of franchise set up there, they were pretty strict. Yeah. So we did sell the 13 Dimeth stuff for a little while, but <laughs> as soon as it was off the shelf, it was off the shelf. It was gone. We weren't we were allowed to break rules. It wasn't in yeah. your car park. No, yeah. no, no. <laughs> I've, I've gone to a supplement store and they're like, you tested or untested? And I'm like, oh, I'm nothing really. I don't compete in anything. And I'm like, I'm not, I've never done any gear or anything, but I look at the, the, the supplement, I'm like, oh fuck, I'm not going to get popped for what? Something that's like low level speed that I'm using in the gym, like whatever. So I'm like, oh, fucking untested, whatever. And he's like, all right. He's like, <laughs> he's like, he's like, this one here, he's like, I'll give you like more like that, like aggression, yeah? Like you have it, and like you're more aggressive. He's like, this one here, it's like you get this like more euphoria. I'm like, fuck you, sell I just want to train, bro. Like, I just swear to God, this is the best experience of my life. And I just kept asking questions because the shit going. that was coming out of his mouth was yeah. gold. Like, it was. I still remember. Really like, yeah, so there's no regulations. Yeah. I remember <laughs> when you came back with that. That that pre workout was chat. Yeah, I had what it. Was it? I, I didn't like oh, psychotic. So it, it was called psychotic. No, it was. no, there was one called psychotic, and there was another one that had like new pept in it, like a new tropic. And it's like this one, you're laser focused, but then also you're gonna be up. And I'm like, I was up for about 15 minutes, and then it instantly fucking depressed. I remember, I remember <laughs> we took one, and I felt sick. Like yeah, I yeah, yeah, sick off it. Like, like, that was my thing for we, a bit. Like this guy we, just did, through pure fucking comedic value got my <laughs> like I just go in there to go get the most fucked up pre-workouts they were 
<laughs> and we're all OD on him like once a month. Just stomach oh, cramps. Just, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't like it. I, so, like I obviously tolerate caffeine pretty well. I have, can have high doses of caffeine. Whatever else was in that thing made me, yeah, same sick and anxious, <laughs> trying to deadlift. And I'm like, I just feel like a ball of anxiety. And I'm like, this is not a nice fit. It actually... Well, that's the challenge. It, well, to get <laughs> yeah, through that. Yeah. That's it, the challenge. It, it hindered my training. It made my... It, oh, absolutely. It didn't make my training better. Yeah, but if you learn to conquer it, then you become the phoenix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the... <laughs> that's flapping, <laughs> flapping down poor Melbourne Beach, <laughs> trying to get off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't eaten in 10 days. That's it. That's crazy. Oh. Um, and then how, how, how far into the journey was your first bodybuilding comp? That, that first series there? Um, so, 2014... So a while. So, so th- uh, 33. Yeah. Oh, so training for Eight a while. Eight years of training. Yeah. yeah. Solid. Yeah. yeah. Nice. That's crazy. And how many comps have you done? I mean, it's seven. Seven. And are they going to come back? Ah, oh, man. You done? <laughs> I'm done. You done? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm done. Well, like... Yeah, no, I'm done. done. So, so what? What? Uh, I hang, guess hang the. What do you hang? Hang the jocks up. The frozen trunks. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah hang the trunks yeah. up. Hang the trunks up. Um, yeah. I guess a good question then is from now on. You were talking about the baby making years. So obviously, being a father and whatnot. What does training look like for you now for the next five or ten years? What are you? Some of your goals? How are you? Like, what do you want to achieve out of training and stuff? Yeah. Is it just being an animal? Because that's what we're big on. Pretty much, like, yeah. but kind of like. Yeah, an animal, but like I'm definitely, it's tempered now, like with not with like not being too stupid because of the kids. You know what I mean? Mm. So it was like even in like uh, like lockdowns or COVID, whatever it was. Like yeah. My first son Ruben would have been in his first twelve months, and I remember I tweaked my back. You know what I mean? And it was just like a tweak. It's like man, I'd, before I had kids, but like, he tweaks for breakfast, right? It's just like, <laughs> he, tweaks for breakfast, fine. <laughs> but like kids are ruthless. <laughs> like kids are ruthless. You have no like yeah. they yeah. care. So just like having to like deal with like parenting, <laughs> like with that, it kind of made me realize, oh, okay. Like there's just cut around to the wife and say, Hey, I'm not lifting that today or I'm putting that chore off till tomorrow when you've got kids. Yeah. So uh, there's definitely like that element to it, but you know, for now, like I'm just training just to like maintain, you know, I'm yep. just downsized at the minute. Uh, the, I, you know, still like an element of strength, you know, when you're asking sort of before, like how I like to train, I do like to keep in those movements just for sheer preference side of things yeah um and i envision you know once the new business is settled a little bit once the kids are a bit more settled and stuff like that i'll probably keep training and intensity back up um yeah. and hover at a certain strength and body composition which is nowhere near bodybuilding days but probably maybe halfway in between here and there yeah yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. close that gap a bit yeah how old are your kids you might have said it before and i missed it one and nearly three three cool because one of my goals is to be the Jack Dad at school. <laughs> that's one of my goals. I think you've ticked I that box. <laughs> yeah, I think you've ticked that box. But that's what I want to be. Like whenever it is, have, whenever we end up having kids, it's still a while away. But yeah, the Jack Dad at pickup. Man, I got like, it, it's funny. Like that is absolutely my 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 focus as well. For, like, what I do, right? But it also like has made me look back at like the bodybuilders I know who've gone through preps with kids and stuff like that. Yeah. With a whole new respect. I'm like, man. For that, yeah. I, you just, I had no appreciation of what that must have been like until I became a parent myself. And people sort of say, would you do it now? And I'm like, I, I can't function for the last eight weeks in a prep. Like I literally like put work aside. You know, I tell my clients, hey, this is kind of like what kind of contribution you're going to get from me out of now. Mm. You know, might put some people on pause and things like that. For me to try and consider how that would work with kids in the mix, I have no idea. I don't want to go out and get drunk right now because, like, having a hang- hangover the next day with kids is horrific. I've, I've heard mean, that. Let- I've, had, I've had that conversation with a client downstairs. He's like, stop drinking because he's like my two year old. He goes, it's literally torture on a Sunday yeah, waking up and you got a two year old to run around after. Yeah. yeah. I saw my brother have to do it after my Bucks party. You know what I mean? He had kids before me and I just like saw the aftermath of what that looks like. And I was like, that looked like the most horrible <laughs> Torture. day of his life, you know, with his kids after my bucks. So yeah. Be the but Jack dad. The Jack dad. That's the goals. The, um, you ever rock up to school in a stringer? Nah. <laughs> we don't wear stringers. Nah. Do you wear stringers? Do you wear stringers? At all? <laughs> Do you wear stringers still? At all? No, not now. Not now. <laughs> not like, now. Are they still in much? No, I don't see I, them around. I don't see them around. Like, they were I, big like 10, 15 maybe years the oldies. ago. I don't know. Where do you yeah. train? Are you only training at home? At Athletic Com. Ath- athletic around Com. Around the yeah. Yeah, neighbours. Yeah. I don't see them anymore. I mean, I used to be sponsored by uh, Active Wear, who was the distributor for Gasp and Better Bodies, which are bodybuilding yeah, brands. brands clothing. Yeah, yeah. And I used to love their Gaspari, stuff. Gaspari, wasn't it? Was it Gaspari? No, it was no, Gasp is different. Oh, Gasp yeah. is different, yeah. 
And, you know, they had a lot of sort of stringers and stuff like that. They weren't as stringerish as <laughs> you can get. You know, there's, <laughs> there's shoelace. Stringer and there's, yeah, yeah there's shoelace. <laughs> there's may uh, as well just wear nothing. Yeah. 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 I, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I, enjo- I, I enjoyed wearing them back then, you know, but I feel like, for, I don't know, I have nothing... No idea You've matured. That. That's all right. Yeah. You've matured. I couldn't get away with it now. What am I talking about? <laughs> I've, only, I've only ever owned black one. Blue. Black and blue. Yeah, I've, I've like owned one bodybuilder stringer. influence. The 80s. Yeah. They, they sell all the old school stuff. We'll rock stringers. Maybe the crop tops have come back. <laughs> crop tops are back. Yeah, What's going the on there? I don't know. It's it's just the new... And things just do... It's just like a, on a 30-year yeah. cycle. It's, it's, like, it's like the fashion now for the kid uh, powerlifters. They wear fucking wife beaters, short shorts... Yeah, you know, like floral and or crop shorts. tops. Yeah, yeah. there you go. To their own. <laughs> it's all gone full circle. Yeah, I used to slam. Um, it was uh, strong liftwear. That was my. Oh, yeah. I used That's to love that. Eddie yeah. Young, because I was just obsessed with. I, I used was to, Aaron Curtis as well. Aaron Curtis. Yeah, yeah. Did you have the neon green shorts? Nah, I used to get the the, the singlets and shit. I had some trackies. Are they still around? No stringers. They're still, yeah, they're still yeah, around. Yeah. They're still around, yeah. I had a look at their stuff just recently. I was like, because it popped up and I was like, oh, I actually haven't looked at their stuff for years. I was like, I'll just see what they're selling. And it's still similar. Stringers. It's very Choco bodybuilding yeah, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Muscle City kind of spec. Yeah. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. That was a Thanks fun chat. It. I really yeah. enjoyed it. It was awesome to hear about some of the old bodybuilding stories. 10 day fast. I reckon I might hit it up. Yeah, you and me too. Poor Dougie we, prep. Poor we Dougie. did we did thirty six hours or something. Yeah, and I broke it with a cheese board. <laughs> Wouldn't recommend that either. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> Ten days. All righty, we're done. Thank you very much. Uh, all the links will be down below uh, in the description box and in the bios. If you could help us out, sharing, subscribing, and liking, that would be great. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you. That was-